Is there any artificial person? I need to connect my laptop.
Success. Assalamu alaikum everybody. I know it's about time. Uh, I would like to give a couple more minutes so that the speakers, some of the speakers can get a little comfortable uh, using bath, uh, uh, bathroom and toilet. So inshallah, uh, please give me, give us a couple more minutes. And um, fortunately, we will have a little extra time. Uh, you know, so we don't have to rush because the room is available afterwards after the session. I know some of you will have to leave, but that's okay. But uh, the good news is that we'll, they cannot kick us out. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you for coming and joining this session, a very important session, and Rohingya Genocide uh, session, uh, Rohingya Genocide in Burma. Uh, I would like to open this session with a Quran citation. I would like to invite Brother Abu Siddiq Arman, who just flew in from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, uh, to attend this session. Uh, so he will be flying back Tuesday. So he came here from United States for three days from Riyadh for this Rohingya session. He is also a Rohingya, born in Arkan. So I would like to invite Brother Abu Siddiq Arman to recite a short surah uh, opening this session. Please, Brother Siddiq. Uh, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم Thank you very much, Brother Abu Siddiq. It's very, alhamdulillah, great recitation. Dr. Abu Siddiq is a PhD doctoral candidate in King Saud University in Riyadh, Rohingya. And he is not only doing doctoral studies, PhD, he is very, alhamdulillah, knowledgeable and fluent in Islam. Thank you, Jazakallah Khair. Uh, today, uh, before I go to each honorable speakers, distinguished speakers, I would like to give you some idea about how serious this issue is, that the depth and width of the pro problem of Rohingya people are facing in the genocidal campaign by the government of Myanmar and the Buddhist radicals against Rohingya people. I would like to call on a couple of witnesses to give you a personal story on a personal touch that they have suffered. Uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, invite to the podium Sister, uh, 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 Sister, Sabura, Sister Sabura from Arkan that she personally witnessed and suffered these atrocities and genocidal campaign fight by the government of Myanmar and the Buddhist radicals. Please, Sister Sabura, please come to the podium. I'm going to do translation for you in English. And sister said uh, she's going to describe what happened to Rohingya Muslims in Arkan. <laughs> In 2012 violence, the Burmese Rakhine Buddhist forces came to Rohingya villages and told them that they have heard that there may be a turbulent situation and they came here 
to provide protection to the Rohingya villages and the surrounding Rohingya villages and told the people to stay in the village, not to get out of the village uh, uh, or anywhere. And then a couple of hours later, the, the, all the soldiers, Rakhine police and Rakhine army, uh, Burmese army has disappeared. And then Buddhist mobs moved in and attacked Rohingya families. And uh, you can see that that's planned. The, the forces, Myanmar forces came and told the Rohingya villages not to go anywhere, means they are going to be confined so that they can run away, so that they planned the attack. She said that in her own eyes she witnessed that the Buddhist mobs backed by the Rakhine police, Buddhist police has attacked the Rohingya Muslim families in the house. They have killed the household members. They have killed the children. They have killed, killed the elderly who cannot even walk. And they have thrown, they set, they set the houses on fire. She personally saw in her eyes. They have set houses on fire and throw the children to the fire. And also they kill the elderly and throw them in the fire, burn them. And they pull all the young women and they rape them in front of her eyes. And not only rape them, they have shot them after raping and killed these uh, young women that who were raped by these uh, Rakhine Buddhists and Burmese forces. They, so they left, they have to leave their, their villages, they left, went to IDP camps, many of them are IDP camps, many of them have left somehow to Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Bangladesh, wherever they could find the refuge. And they arrived here and then they are thanking the government of the United States and the community, interfaith community and resettlement agencies. Uh, United Nations refugee, uh, UNHCR and others that they have changed their lives to bring this in the country so that they do not have to worry about ki uh, getting killed anymore and they are seeking your support in this country that they want to advance the Rohingya cause through your support uh, in this country. <laughs> We came here to this country, we found the refuge. And we are not happy. We are, we, although we, are, we have a secure life here, we have to worry every night. We cannot sleep because for those who we have left, for those who we left behind in our homeland. And we cannot, we cannot find peace in our lives. No matter where we go, we still have to worry. And your help, we hope that your help, your our support to our cause can only solve this issue. So that's our testimony to you that how a person, a, a, how, how a person herself has witnessed in front of her own eyes what happened to her neighbors, what happened to our villagers, the atrocity. If these are all part of the plan by the radicals in the government in conjunction with the monks 
radical elements in the country. Now I would like to call upon Mr. Samuel Shropshire, who is the founder of Muslim Voice for Peace and Reconciliation. Mr. Shropshire have gone to refugee camps and he has personally witnessed the plight of Rohingya in the camps and he will give a brief statement in English. I would say that I've worked in human rights for 35 years. I came to Islam three and a half years ago through a good friend, Shafi Zubir, who is a Rohingya, who brought me to Islam. I'm very grateful. Because of Shafi, I decided to go and take a look at my, for myself in Burma, Thailand, refugee camps, as well as in Bangladesh. What I saw, I have never witnessed in my 35 years of work in human rights. In Bangladesh, I was able to visit UNCHR, United Nations refugee camps, in the south, there are 60,000 Rohingya in refugee camps. Many of them have been there for 20 years. It's an unbearable situation. Nobody should remain in a refugee camp for 20 years. But the worst is on the streets of Bangladesh. 240,000 Rohingya refugees many of them children without parents. Their parents died either in Bangladesh or while they were en route through the junk, through the forest to get to Bangladesh from Arakan. Thousands of children living on the street, trying to survive, many of them selling drugs to survive. Many of them being sexually abused to survive. I pray that something can be done to make this issue more known throughout the world. We as Muslims have an awesome responsibility to care for our own. There's enough money within the Muslim world to take care of the situation. More needs to be done. Thank you for letting me. Thank you very much, Mr. Shropshire, for giving your personal accounts on what you have witnessed in the Rohingya refugee camps. There is only tip of an iceberg. There's only a small portion what uh, Mr. Shropshire described in Bangladesh. You go to Thailand, they call it detention centers. They don't have any refugee camps. Detention centers. Uh, there are 10, 15, 20,000 Rohingya men, women, and children are there, and they have been sold to human traffickers. And there are reports from writers we have seen that that authenticated reports that these women and children and they are being trafficked to sex slave industry in southern Thailand. The, 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 the boat people crisis and many other things. So this is the refugee camps in those countries are dire situation. And not to forget the refugee IDP camps inside Myanmar, inside Burma in our country. They are targets of human traffickers. They are selling women and children for the sex industry and other hard labor situation. Uh, I'm going to get started now with the speakers, but I would like to give you a quick overview of the situation mm -hmm. and, then, uh, uh, and then update you with the current status, and then our distinguished speakers will have 10 minutes each to give their perspective. And then at the end, after, after all the speakers speak, and then I would like to take some questions from the audience for any speakers uh, that you might want to address too. Um, as you know, uh, the, the, the situation 
situation in Arkan, you just heard, you have just you have just heard has not improved. It has not improved. On top of that, they have they have gone from bad from bad to bad to worse. You have heard all the stories. This is what happened. I want to give you a very quick brief. This what's happening in the Muslim plight of Muslims, Muslims, Rohingya, is all pre-planned. It's part of the national strategy because of the government of Myanmar and the Buddhist radicals uh, have developed this genocidal strategy to eliminate Rohingya population. If you look at the, at the Roman statue, read the articles, what is genocide? And look at the, what's happened to Rohingya. You cannot separate them. We often in the community back, go to backstage to say bravely that it's a genocide or not, but let's go by definition. Then we will argue whether it's a genocide or not. We don't want to be diplomatic. International community wants to be sometimes diplomatic, but the reality remains what is happening in our country. These are people and government has done this. They use monks, they use radicals to, to, to cause the violence so that, you know, this is the tactic, a strategy they use. Government of Myanmar does not want to address the core issues of citizenship that they have taken away from Rohingya people. They don't want to address the core issues of human rights that include freedom of movement, free to marry, marry, uh, a free uh, freedom to seek higher education, land ownership, free to worship, want to pray. You don't have that freedom. That all series of human rights violations, Myanmar government does not want to address that, so they will develop a, 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 a distracted distraction strategy to distract from the core issues of violence. So now, after the 2012 and 2030 violence, they stop the violence because they can stop it. They can create. They have the. They have. They have the. The strategy. They are the masterminds. So they stopped it. Now, what will happen? International international community want to do anything about Rohingya issue, they say, oh, no, we cannot do this. It will create instability. It will create violence in our country. So let's not do this. You see, this is the whole idea. The whole, the tool, the instrument they are using as violence. Anything they want to do, they use Rakhine as an as a excuse, as a reason why they don't want to do it. They, can, they are not allowing international NGOs to go and give, provide, a humanitarian assistance. International community asks, why cannot we go there and give that this to all people, Rohingya and Buddhists all, not just Rohingya, all people affected by this violence. And, and they said, oh no, you cannot go, we cannot let you go there because it will cause violence. So and so and so, so, so. Give the citizenship back to Rohingya. Return of IDPs, 140,000 Rohingya and command IDPs are in camps. 21st century concentration camps. That's what United, uh, New York Times called it. 20, they went there and they saw it. They call it 21st century concentration camp. They, they, they are not allowing the Rohingya IDP, IDPs to return to their uh, villages in 13 townships. What's the, what's the reason? Verification. Or oh, they have to verify. We know what to verify. They are really from here. What they did? They burned their villages. You have heard the story. They lost all the documents. They could not take any nationality cards, NRC card, phone call show, that all what they have, family, family registration card, everything. They lost everything. They don't have anything. Now, how they can produce? What they can produce show that they are not from there. These are all pre-planned. This is, the situation is very dire with the verification process. They are demanding now that they have to be verified that they are from there, not from somewhere else. And they come with green card ideas, pink card ideas. They gave the white cards and take them away, took them away. So this is what is going on. There is a crisis after a crisis we are facing now. Uh, before we can address one crisis, there's second one. So we cannot go to the first one. Before second one is addressed, a third crisis. So you cannot go to the second one. These are domino effects we are facing. So right now, there are very little room to talk about citizenship. Now, every day, there's bad news. Last week, two weeks ago, on top of all this, bad news was that 
religious conversion law, okay, marriage law, these kind of laws are there passing. You read those laws and you read the 1935 Nuremberg law in Nazi Germany. Article 1 to Article 7. Article 1, 2, 3, please read that. Only thing you are not finding there is a Rohingya name This is the 1935 Nuremberg law from Nazi Germany is revisiting Myanmar in this 21st century age. And, and this happening under the watchful eyes of the international community. These are serious situations we are facing. So we have conversion. A Muslim woman can marry a Buddhist man, but a Muslim man cannot more marry a Buddhist woman. Religion conversion law, the same thing. You can, Muslim can convert to Buddhism, but Buddhists cannot convert to Islam. Or a Christian minority of Christian religion for that matter. For that matter. So these kind of laws are being passed two, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Again, last week, uh, two weeks ago, Rohingya MPs who were officially elected, the citizen Rohingya MPs, they were banned. They cannot contest in the election. They won the election, 2010 election, national election. election. Now they said, no, you are not from here. You are not citizen of Myanmar. You cannot stand for election. So they denied all the Rohingya MPs not giving permission and banned them from election. And then comes Rohingya voters. This is the first time in the history of Rohingya, in Arkan, in Myanmar, the Rohingya people are not allowed to vote. 2010 election, they were able to vote with using the white cards the government gave them. Now they're taking away white cards. It's a few months ago, six months ago, projecting this, what's happening today, to deny their voting rights. So Rohingya people cannot vote, Rohingya people cannot stand for election for the first time in the history of Burma. So these are the situation. We we can go on and on. These our, 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 our distinguished speakers will give you in their perspective. That personally they visit the places. But one thing I want to mention that what can we do about this? What can we do? There, there are the solution is outside Burma. The inside Burma, they have marginalized Rohingya community. They are threatening to arrest. They are beating them. They cannot speak out for the rights. So international community is the answer. Uh, we have been a strong advocate in the international community. Arka Rohingya Union and Burma Task Force and many other organizations have been a strong advocate of Rohingya cause internationally. We have made tremendous progress. United Nations General Assembly. We have four or five resolutions about Rohingya and Myanmar. United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. We have four or five resolutions. Recently, a couple of months ago, there was a strong resolution proposed and passed, proposed by OIC, uh, sponsored by Pakistan, Alhamdulillah, and it was passed in Human Rights Council, United Nations in Geneva. You have a resolution for one, we have resolution 418 in US Congress. Inshallah, we, will, we are pursuing for another one in Senate. So, a Canadian parliament has had hearing. Uh, there are some hearing over Rohingya issues and the Capitol Hill many times. So internationally, we need to keep the pressure on Burma. The, the word I always use is sustain. We, we, have done, we have done effectively this work throughout the world, but our, we have to be careful not to drop the ball, not to slow down. We have to sustain the momentum. We have to increase the momentum so that Burma government looks for windows where things are sliding, and then they will do the bad things. Old people crisis, there were international outcry three months ago, right? And they are something. Now old people crisis, has outcry, international outcry has subsided. So they are going back to what they have been doing to Rohingya people. So we need to sustain the momentum internationally. Uh, you American Muslim Ummah, you have your congressmen, you have your district, you have your senators, you need to reach out to them and voice your demand that and as an American Muslim, you have you are asking your senators to uh, support the resolution in Senate, in the House, and to pressure White House to to work with foreign uh, foreign relations committee and others in in Capitol Hill, and work with NGOs, NGOs like United Women Genocide, 
very effective, alhamdulillah, Washington. So that's what the, your job is. You can make the difference. Rohingya people in Burma are trying, but you know their situation. Every one of you count. Every one of you count. Lend your support. You don't have to put financial support. Always. Your moral support, uh, uh, political support, humanitarian support. There's all kind of support you can lend. You know, being here is significant support. Being here just listening to our speakers. You can, you can do that. And you have a moral obligation, moral responsibility to save a community in, 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 in the world, in one corner of the world, for Burma is about to disappear. They are headed for extinction, and you can save them. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah, and now I'm going to, I give the coverage, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is, is here. We are very honored to have our first speaker, Lord Nazir Ahmad, from British Parliament. And I'll give you a very quick uh, background about Lord Nazir Ahmad. He came, flew from London to attend this session and read this session. And Lord Nazir Ahmad is a member of the House of Lords in British Parliament. And he, was, he has a long career, but I'm, I'm going to highlight a couple of things. Lord Ahmad began his political career as a li local Labour Party councillor in 1990 becoming chair of the South Yorkshire Labour Party in 1993 and served at both positions until 2000. And there are much more Lord Nazir is doing in British Parliament. He is a strong advocate of Rohingya cause. Uh, inshallah, Lord Nazir will give his perspective on how they have been active on Rohingya in the UK. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, um, Dr. Bakaruddin, a very distinguished panel of speakers, brothers and sisters, uh, assalamu alaikum. Let me first of all say thank you to ISNA for um, organizing this meeting uh, this afternoon. Um, I had prepared some notes to speak uh, on very similar uh, issues which uh, you heard the moving testimonies and of course Brother Bukhar Deen um, who has um, given us detail um, of the genocide that is taking place. Um, I'm afraid I'm the least qualified out of the panel uh, because uh, uh, Honourable uh, Thomas Andrews, who uh, is working not only uh, in Washington DC but around the world and he's visited uh, the um, areas with the Rohingya community uh, and of course uh, uh, my brother Abdul Malik Mujahid uh, not only uh, has been uh, running campaign here in the United States but internationally I know that he uh, was one of the organizers of the conference in Oslo and other speakers have similar experience. I can tell you that last week I was in um, uh, Korea, in Seoul, and there was a, a conference on peace and development and um, a monk from Sri Lanka who was the chancellor of university where monks are trained uh, made a, a very uh, a good speech in relation to uh, the uh, this peaceful religion of Buddhism. And he said that Buddhism is the most peaceful religion in the world. And of course, uh, a lot of what he said, I think all the religions generally share uh, in terms of values and in terms of their beliefs. And then when um, he finished and there was opportunity to ask questions, uh, I was the first one to raise my hand and I said, Sir, could you please explain to me, I always thought that Buddhism is a very peaceful religion. Everybody in the world thinks Buddhism is the most peaceful. In fact, they don't say that about Islam or Christianity, but they say about Buddhism. And I said that I went to Sri Lanka and I saw BBS, those Buddhist monks burning down houses and buildings and and businesses of Muslims 
And then you have 969 and uh, uh, Thomas was telling me that they've changed their name now. Um, the Buddhist monks who've been involved with rape, burning down houses and burning down mosques and of course could driving communities out of their houses. How does that uh, uh, compare with what you've just said? And he was very diplomatic. He sort of, first of all, said, you know, you are from England. I studied there. It's a great country just to calm me down. Uh, and then, but he was very clever. Then he turned it around and he said, you know, Islam is a peaceful religion and you've got ISIS. And, you know, we also have 5% of our, 95% is very peaceful. But what I said back, was that ISIS is not made of muftis and imams. Yours are Buddhist monks who are doing this. And that's the difference. But I also, and there's no justification for ISIS by the way. Because I did try to explain that ISIS has nothing to do with Islam. These are former socialist Saddam Hussein's Baathists who were driven out because we had uh, sort of dismantled the state and we dismantled the soldiers and their administration and sent them back. We didn't give them a penny. We didn't give them anything. And they were pushed back. And the new government, uh, which uh, was led from Najaf and uh, Maliki's government, that pushed them so economically. And no justification what they're doing. But that gave them a cause to fight. And they, the only thing that could unite them was not socialism or Baathism, but it was about Islam. It was Islam that actually united them, uh, at least in, in my understanding. But today, what you see uh, in uh, both in Burma and in Sri Lanka is that these monks um, that have been uh, doing this. So, um, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, when we first saw those terrible. Uh, photographs on social media. Many of you would have seen those horrible pictures of boys, girls, old men being slaughtered and bodies laid on the floor. Houses that are burned down and of course you must have visited the two stalls here uh, at the uh, convention center. And those uh, pictures of innocent people that have been burned down and of course British newspapers have said that Rohingya community is the most persecuted community in the world. And I totally ag agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Vakaruddin that these are, this regime is the modern fascists, the Nazis. They're using exactly the same tactics. And if you look, I mean, uh, two and a half years ago when I actually saw these pictures, Immediately, we organized a meeting with the uh, ambassador of Burma, uh, and Myanmar, and uh, we went to see him with a delegation of politicians, um, Muslim politicians in the British uh, Parliament, as well as uh, one brother uh, who is from uh, uh, Burma. And we went to see him, and of course, he tried to justify. And then he gave us this excuse, and he said, well, you know, uh, most of these people are not from Burma. They are new people from their Bangladeshi uh, citizens who have come after 1971 and who are actually still coming in because they are economic migrants. And then I, I check up. Then I actually done some uh, uh, research and Muslims have been in Burma when Minso in 1430 uh, of the kingdom of Maruk, after 24 four years of uh, uh, him uh, being deposed, he stayed uh, uh, in, in Bengal. And then he regained control of the Arkanese throne in 1430 and with the military assistance from the uh, Bengal Sultanate. So Muslims came along from Bengal 1430. And so going back, hundreds of years of these communities that have been there. But more importantly, British, we, when we actually took over this piece of land, as we've done in the past, we've taken some people with us who could produce some, uh, uh, some uh, 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 products, 
so we can make money but also uh, so keep our soldiers over there going back um, uh, over 100 years uh, in 1826 um, uh, there was uh, uh, that, that's when the British took over and then they took uh, farmers uh, laborers uh, from this part of the world uh, but really the, the problem actually started as I see it is since this military regime took over and because because they deprived democracy they wanted to divert all their problems and blame the Muslims like the Nazis did blaming the Jewish communities in uh, in Europe they have done exactly the same and they are uh, uh, sort of r running a uh, similar type of uh, laws and rules. Um, you've heard about um, the deprivation of their citizenship, deprivation of their rights, the new green card, no right to vote, no right to stand for elections. From 1946 to 1962, uh, Rohingya uh, members of parliament, but in fact, they were members in the government too as ministers. And today, even, even, the great democratic leader, Aung San Chi, the one that we celebrate around the world, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, she does not mention Rohingya community. That's a shame. That's a shame. And we should say it as well. So whilst, whilst they, you know, the, uh, the uh, regime talks about um, this, uh, the whole thing started from the gold shop, the arguments there, then they talk about this rape, uh, allegedly, and then uh, actually, uh, like uh, Brother Vakar said, and all the speakers will tell you, this was designed, this was done deliberately, and deprivation uh, of uh, their citizenship, their rights, and actually, I have no idea what their plans are, really, because the problem with, uh, with this situation is, that sadly nobody wants the Rohingya communities anywhere. And that's why you saw over 2,700 people perish in the sea and nobody wanted them and being thrown uh, into the sea, in deep uh, sea water. So I think uh, there are other speakers and I really you know, didn't want to take time, but I think that there are a number of things that we can demand from our parliamentarians. Um, yes, I congratulate the Congress for, uh, for the fantastic resolution and I hope that the Senate uh, will, uh, will also pass something. We have a, an all-party parliamentary group uh, with Baroness Kinnock, who's a, a great woman, uh, a wife of former leader of the Labour Party, Neil Kinnock, uh, and she was a minister in uh, uh, Labour government as well. She's a, a strong advocate and also chairman of the all-party parliamentary group, uh, which... Uh, supports the Rohingya community. Uh, we don't have a similar system, but at least this APPG is doing uh, quite a lot of work. But I think we, together, we should be demanding uh, that uh, this regime ends the, its policies, of, uh, policies and practices of genocide and restores full and equal citizenship rights to Rohingya communities. Uh, we should demand that the, uh, they institute the right of return of all the displayed people. Uh, and we should also demand but, uh, and, and that they provide protection for the vulnerable and for all the communities, uh, including uh, Rohingya community. And then uh, that they should uh, actively promote uh, reconciliation between communities because they're the ones who've actually created this hatred uh, between uh, Muslims and non-Muslims. But can I say, this? we can demand these things unless we demand that the international community should put sanctions on this regime, it's not going to happen. So let's demand that there should be sanctions put on this Burmese government until they give rights and protection uh, to the innocent and forced uh, 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 people of uh, Burma, the Rohingya communities. So I've just come to show my solidarity with yourself and anything that we can do, inshallah, uh, we will be supporting you from London and from Europe. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Lord Nazir Ahmad, for your touching speech on Rohingya issue. And that's going to go a long way on the international level. Now I call upon our second distinguished speaker, Honorable Tom Andrews. Uh, Honorable Tom Andrews is the president and the chief executive officer of the United to End Genocide based in Washington, D.C., in the United States. Congressman, uh, Honorable Tom Andrews is a former congressman from the state of Maine, and he was most recently served, he, he, more, he has most recently served as the national director of Win Without War, a coalition of the 40 national organizations promoting a more progressive national security strategy that calls for prudent use of military engagement. He has worked to promote democracy and human rights throughout the world, many regions of the world. Honorable Tom Andrews is a strong advocate of Rohingya people. He, he has fought for Rohingya in the Capitol Hill, testified with me many times in the Congress hearings, and he was actively engaged in for a resolution 418 and pursuing right now uh, for more resolutions from U.S. Senate as well as more resolution from U.S. Uh, House of Representatives. Uh, Honorable Tom Andrews has visited Arkan, visited many parts of Burma. He has personally witnessed how these people are suffering. And uh, I call upon Honorable Tom Andrews to provide, provide his perspective and his experience and his views and visions about Rohingya Cross. Please welcome Honorable Tom Andrews. Thank you very much, Dr. Dean, and thank you very much, everyone. I brought my watch with me because, as I told the group in the, in the last ISNA conference that I had the honor to participate in, I, I confessed that I was a recovering politician, and that as much as I would like to keep my comments brief, I make sure I have my watch uh, on me so that I'm assured to keep them brief because it's kind of a, well, it's kind of what you get when you're a politician, you end up speaking on and on. But we have some very important speakers here today. We're short on time, so I'm going to try and and reduce my remarks to uh, the essence of what I would like to say today. Since the last uh, ISNA conference in which I spoke, I wish I could come today and tell you that conditions have improved, but as you've heard so pointedly and powerfully today, and as we've seen in the news over the last year, things have deteriorated, they've gotten even worse. And as we've heard the rights of the Rohingya have been systematically abolished, denied, and campaigns of hatred and bigotry, systematic campaigns, well-financed campaigns, stirring up fear and hatred among the people of Burma, about Muslims, the Muslim community in general, and the Rohingya in particular, they've never been more powerful, well-financed, and sophisticated. So things I'm afraid to say are even worse than they were when I addressed the ISNA conference last year. But I want to say that there is hope as well. There are elements of hope. And the hope resides in our minds, in our hearts, and in compassion, a fundamental ingredient of the values of Islam. And we've been able to see those three combined with action to move people in directions that are so important. Inadequate, we have a long way to go, but we've been able to see movement in the right direction. Last year I asked uh, everyone who was participating to please support H.R. 418, a resolution before the House of Representatives that brought this crisis directly to the floor of the House and called upon not only the government of Myanmar to change its policies and reverse direction from the systematic persecution, but called on the government of the United States to take a stronger stand 
on behalf of the Rohingya. It passed overwhelmingly. And one of the most powerful moments of that debate was the fact that they took, I, I, I've been, since I've been here last, I've been up uh, into the camps visiting Rohingya uh, three times, three different trips. And I took photographs of what I saw because it would be unbelievable, I thought, to just simply try to describe what I was seeing. So I took these photographs and I brought them to the, the halls of Congress and leaders of both the Democratic and Republican Party said, when we go to the floor to talk about the Rohingya, we want your photographs on the floor with us showing the Rohingya people. We want to tell the stories of the suffering that is going on in that part of the world. And so the head and the heart, the compassion, was appealed to of members of Congress and the American public. And just as we saw in, in the horrible tragedy going on in Syria and in Europe just two days ago, that photograph of a three-year-old Syrian that was, that was on a beach, face down, drowned, trying to save himself and his, 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 his father trying to save his family, has turned around the intransigence of so many governments to not accept and not support those who are seeking, seeking salvation. The head and the heart, very, very powerful. I went to, to, to into uh, the camps, uh, as I mentioned three times. One of my trips, I brought a group of ASEAN parliamentarians from Indonesia and from Malaysia and from Cambodia. Uh, and, and, and nations around ASEAN. And I said, I want you to see for yourself what it is we're talking about. Because ASEAN, in addition to the United States, is in a position of incredible influence uh, on uh, the government of Myanmar. And you must act in ways that you haven't acted before. So we went, we saw, we issued a report which, we, which I have brought today. And this report was put before the ASEAN Summit of Prime Ministers in Kuala Lumpur in the spring and was delivered to the, each Prime Minister that was attending that summit. These parliamentarians had a news conference that was widely covered, covered throughout the region, the New York Times, the Washington Post, it was covered in Burma. And for the first time, the ASEAN Prime Ministers decided that the principle of non-interference, which is such a, a, a core principle of the way ASEAN works, was no longer adequate. The Foreign Minister of Malaysia announced in a news conference opening up that summit he said, ladies and gentlemen, the principle of non-interference is no longer adequate when we see the crisis of the Rohingya before our very eyes. And then, of course, we heard the boat crisis, which was a horrible, horrible tragedy. But before the eyes of the world, not only did we see this human tragedy, but this tragedy of negligence of government and public officials. Burma, of course, the government of Myanmar characteristic, characteristically responded by denial. They said that th there are no rain on those boats, and they're certainly not from, from our country. Of course, the president of, of uh, Myanmar says there are no Rohingya in my country. Continues to publicly say this. And then the other governments on the, in the ASEAN countries that were on that, uh, uh, surrounding those uh, poor, desperate people, Instead of mounting a major search and rescue operation, deploying navies to rescue these families, they deployed their navies to tie the boats up and pull them farther out to sea. So they wouldn't have responsibility for those desperate asylum seekers and refugees. This, ladies and gentlemen, is outrageous and unacceptable and should be unacceptable to every human being on this planet. What an outrage. But the world saw it. The world saw it. And from that recognition, the heads, the hearts of some were raised, and finally there was some action. Now, as I said, there is a long, long way to go. There are elements of hope, but the challenge is immense. H.R. 418 passed in the House of Representatives, but those of you who are from this country and helped us to pass 418, we need you to help us to pass a similar uh, piece of, uh, a, res a similar resolution 
in the United States Senate that is now being developed. Senator Robert Menendez of New Jersey is spearheading that effort. We need to generate support. The Senate has to hear from us, number one. Number two, I was so pleased when, when the Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, uh, who leads the Senate, and has been a strong advocate of Aung San Suu Kyi and the reforms uh, the, and the positive steps that were taken when Aung San Suu Kyi went from house arrest into parliament. But he took to the floor a few months ago and he said that he was very disturbed by developments in Burma today. And he says that it's about time for the United States to start reconsidering its relationship with this country and start considering potential sources of economic pressure on that government. We need to support that kind of talk coming from the United States Senate. And President Obama. When President Obama lifted the economic pressure on the government of Burma that led to the reforms that were celebrated a few years ago, he said that he would retain the authority to put individual sanctions on individuals who are responsible for human rights violations. He would put people on a list called the Special Designated Nationals List that would provide penalties for them and their families. Economic bite, in other words. There is not a, despite the fact that human rights violations have skyrocketed in the past few years, particularly against the Rohingya in, in the country of Burma, there is not a single living person that has been added to that list that has been given individual sanctions because of human rights violations. And ladies and gentlemen, that is an outrage. And we have to tell President Obama that the pressure needs to start now to defend the people uh, in our part of the world. Now, I'm looking at my, my watch. I'm about to wind up. Uh, uh, that is to even go further, but I'm going to wind down. Um, to tell you that we are in the midst right now of a very dangerous situation. The United Nations, UNHCR, issued a report uh, just a few days ago that said that there is a grave danger of that boat crisis breaking out once again. That the combination of the continued deteriorating conditions uh, in Rakhine State, in Burma, in, in, in the camps, the combination of those deteriorating conditions, the blocking of aid going to so many desperate people, and the end of the rainy season, and therefore the possibility of human traffickers uh, enticing more people out to sea is great. So we could be seeing, according to the United Nations, a new wave of uh, refugees and asylum seekers uh, in the dangerous waters uh, once again. We also know that there is an election coming up, a national election in Myanmar in November. And politicians, particularly in this part of the world, are very adept at using fear and prejudice as political weapons. And so we can fully expect that poisonous rhetoric, that dangerous rhetoric, to continue, in fact, to escalate as we move to the elections in November. So we have a very important job to do as Americans, as humans. It is time for us in this period of danger to speak truth to power, to rise up with our heads, our hearts, and our activism to change the course of history. In big ways and small, you know when I was, I had uh, lunch after we had the session one year ago at ISNA, and I asked, um, one of the distinguished speakers, I said, what would be the single most important thing for President Obama to do when he visits Burma in November, which was last year? And he looked at me and he said, if he just said the name Rahim when he was in Burma, because the government is putting all kinds of pressure on governments that do business with Burma to not say the name. And so no one's saying their name. They said even Secretary Kerry never mentioned their name when he went to Burma last. It would be so powerful, he said if the president would just say their name. So when we spoke to the administration, we talked to key officials in the State Department, they said, oh, well, what's in the name? What's in the name? And so we started, we started a, a campaign in which, uh, a, a Instagram campaign, I gave this speech to some kids up in Maine, and they said, that's terrible, we're gonna start an Instagram campaign. And, they, and it was, everyone was holding a sign, and it said, Mr. President, just say their name. Just say their name. And this went from Falmouth High School 
to all over the world, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, until finally, at the end of the strip, an Associated Press reporter said there's something going on all over the internet that wants you to say the name Rohingya. Mr. President, will you say the name? And he said the name, and he said, we need to stop the attacks that are going on against this world. So in big ways, in big ways and in small ways, let us recognize the horror, but let's also recognize the hope. And with our heads and our hearts and our action, let's save the ring again. Thank you very much. We're doing okay with time. Uh, before I call upon our next distinguished speaker, I do want to uh, thank uh, Lord Nazir Ahmed for coming here because Lord Nazir will have to catch a flight and then Lord Nazir will be leaving in a few minutes. So let's please thank Lord Nazir Ahmed. Uh, our next honorable speaker is Imam Dr. Abdul Malik Mujahid. And I don't think I need to introduce, uh, say a lot about Dr. Mujahid because um, an American Muslim Ummah is well, uh, well recognized, has well recognized Dr. Mujahid's dedication to Rohingya cause. Uh, briefly, Dr. Mujahid is an American Muslim Imam, an award-winning author, and a producer with focus on contemporary social issues, public policy, and Islam, Islam West and West relations. He chairs Burma Task Force USA, which is a coalition of 19 major American organizations to stop the genocide in Burma. Imam Mujahid also serves currently as serving as the chair of the Parliament of World's Religions. Imam Mujahid is very passionate about Rohingya issue. He is a strong advocate, particularly in the United States, and he often travels to international destinations. Uh, he has been to Malaysia, Indonesia, met with Rohingya refugees, and has a personal story he has. And Dr. Mujahid is also very active in mobilization of communities throughout the world, and conducted many seminars, sponsored many seminars and Rohingya uh, sessions in Oslo and many other locations. And Dr. Mujahid will continue to support our cause and is very dedicated. And Dr. Mujahid will give his views on Rohingya issues and his achievements and his mission on um, this day. Please welcome Dr. Mujahid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord Nasir Ahmed, um, uh, <coughs> Congressman, and the rest of the distinguished speakers, the most which I would like to recognize is the presence of a good number of uh, Rohingyas themselves in the audience. Uh, I would say, may Allah bless you, make uh, your challenges of settling in a new country uh, easier for you. And where that sister um, Islam, I am here, but what about those people who are over there? And that was the phrase which I keep hearing uh, from the people who were just three, four days before I met them and arrived in Indonesia. After all this story and conversation, they said, well, but I am here now. What about those people? So let's pray that those people are blessed with neighbors who are people of open heart and kind minds. And the world realizes there are challenges, but everyone had rights to life. It's very easy when we are victim and supporters are victim. Do not pay attention to the humanity of the other. For that reason, I like to share with you that the American Buddhist community in North America stands very steadfastly with Rohingyas and the challenges they are facing. 
they have, each time I call, the call is not a call about convincing anyone. So just tell us what would you like us to do. And they have done each and everything which we have asked them to do uh, in support of India. So American Buddhist community stands with you. And, and it is very important to realize for Muslims, because we are stereotypes all the time. Islamophobia plays as an element of what is happening to Rohingyas there. And that's the same Islamophobia who killed off almost all Muslims or thrown them out from Central African Republic. And this is the same thing about which New York Times wrote in an editorial, um, sort of heading Holy Alliance or something against Muslims, and it was talking about extremist Buddhists, not all Buddhists in Burma, connecting with extremists in Sri Lanka and connecting with extremist BJP and RSS people in India. And I was surprised that New York Times is keeping that type of an eye on that. So Islamophobia, what we find in America, contributes to hurting people all over the world. So this is an extremely important point to remember. Second point I'd like to share with you is the food is a major problem. When you ask a refugee, as congressman, you might have done, why are you here? So there's nothing to eat. I cannot do a job. So I have to get out somewhere for that purpose. The calorie intake, Professor Penny Green of UK have established, they are being provided food which is at the level slightly higher than Nazi Germany. Unfortunately, Nazi Germany to the people in the camps. Now United Nations have agreed to reduce that calorie count. So now they will be given food which will be lower level of calorie level than it was given to the Nazi concentration camps. So one of the requests is that we pay attention to that and now within those three things, four things they give, they have to sell that to buy fuel, they have to sell that to buy oil to cook or something of this nature. So one of the things which we'll be focusing uh, quite a bit is that those people who are there subject to provision from the United Nations are provided that. So Burma Task Force has essentially operated on one method. And that is, can you give us 10 minutes of your time on the daily basis. And you will have people with our brochures and sign up sheets. So you sign up your emails. So we can all have extraordinary speeches and feel and cry. But we need to translate our passion and anger into action. How do you do that? Burma Task Force model, which is a coalition of 19 organizations, is that we give you a call once a week, sometimes a little more often, but once a week only. It will take you one minute to read what you need to do. And we very clearly identify, today we would like you to make this one phone call, or two phone calls, or three phone calls, or send an email. So one of the campaign we'll be doing is going to about increasing the calorie intake which United Nations has agreed with the Burmese government to officially reduce. So first time in the human history, people who are detained will have no choice but to give in food at that lowest possible level. So, and that 10 minute a campaign is very important for the Muslim community because right now there are other causes being discussed. Muslims have probably as many causes as there are Muslims. My request is just pick one cause. Whatever cause you can pick, whether it's the Black Lives Matter or the poverty in our country, our home places, or Rohingya cause or the Syria cause, pick one cause and spare some time and funding for that. And for the rest of the causes, you can definitely uh, make dua for it. It has worked in an amazingly good way. For example, I'll give you one example. Some good people, some good Buddhist people, they let us know in this city, people have gathered, an attack is about to begin. 
Once we hear that, we do several things. We have a phone call going, we have the email, and action alert to be distributed outside the mosque and the churches for people, and it just requires to create a great level of buzz. So we have by now created about a million people social media network on these issues uh, through 24 different networks. So that phone call, so 10 minutes a day has real meaning. And at least in four occasions which we know those attacks were stopped because of that reason. And not only in that Muslims are involved, but some Buddhists are involved. So when we did our conference in Norway, which we were the main organizers of it, I was co-chair with Mon Journey. We especially picked the location where the Nobel Peace Prizes are given out, Nobel Peace Institute. We selected Norway because Norway talks about peace, its name is associated with peace. But Norway also chairs the peace process in Burma. Everyone with a gun and their leaders are invited to be in the peace process, except Rohingya peoples. They are not invited on the peace process. And there, I had requested one friend, Nobel laureate, and uh, one who is on my advisory board of the Parliament of the World Religion, this one too, too, to have a statement, and they declared it's, it's a genocide. So while sitting there, I was able to make phone calls and said within seven, six to seven hours, we have eight Nobel laureates committing and stating it's a textbook case of genocide, although it doesn't have the mass killing of that level. We did it in Norway because Norway is a place of peace. At this moment, we thought it was, at that moment, we thought it is important, so we invited three monks from Burma who stood up. One of those monks, I love to call, I rarely take my photos with other people, but he was one of the person I requested, can I take a photo with you? He stood up in front of the writers and said, you'll have to kill me first before you're able to kill any Muslim there. These type of monks and these type of priests are among the best of the humanity. We gave them an award of a person who creates harmony among people at the Nobel Institute. All of these campaigns are built with 10 minutes a day. Give 10 minutes a day to stop genocide. I will conclude by saying, and Congressman, exactly on time, my clock is working better, that before you leave, take a brochure and sign up for 10 minutes a day campaign to stop genocide. Thank you so much. There's a medical emergency. One of the Burmese lady speaking Rohingya language, she had an ambulance was there, so I have to do trans interpretation. So, and I sent somebody else to do their job. So, <laughs> back, back in time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Malik Mujahid, Imam Malik Mujahid, for his views and his advocacy in support of Rohingya people. Our next, next distinguished speaker is Mr. Murad Kosi of Zakat Foundation of America. Um, Mr. Kosi is the East Coast Program Director of Zakat Foundation. That is an organization that fosters charitable giving to alleviate the immediate needs of poor communities and to establish long-term development projects that ensure individual and community growth. Please welcome uh, Mr. Murad Kozi to provide his views on Rohingya issue. Assalamu alaikum. 
Is there any, the author in our uh, audience, someone who wrote a book or writing or uh, is planning to write a book? You can raise your voice, put in the hands. It's nice. And then people from Chicago, who are from Chicago? Just uh, make sure. Okay, that's good. And I was saying is that and I'm going to make everybody instantly alter right now, inshallah. And then you're going to be surprised. You know, in Islam, we believe that uh, whatever we do is recorded. Who recorded it? The angels. Right? But what, he, what angels record? The angel does not write from its own mind. Basically, angels record the our book. We are the writer of the our books. So right now, when I am talking here, I am writing my book. And my previous talk was, the future talk, when they are doing, they are writing their books. By coming here, you are writing your book. Alhamdulillah, I think you are writing a nice book today because you are here to help the Rohingya. One of the most persecuted people in the world. So I'm just, I'm so glad that you are here that, that, that just support the Rohingya. Zakat Foundation is a tool. Is a tool. Like the microphone. Let's say, if I speak here, you cannot see me here much. But if I speak here, you hear me because of the tool of the microphone. So to make our life easier to do in, in this life. Zakat Foundation is, is just like that. Just a tool to help the poor and needy around the world. So how we have done? The, you know, for the Rohingya, I have, a, I have a personal side and then the organization side of the world, or the humanitarian aspect. One of my dear uh, teachers, when I was studying Aikido, uh, upstate New York, my teacher is from the Burma. I mean, I, I love him very much. much and then he, not only he was a regular Aikido teacher, he was a spiritual teacher as well. As the brother was uh, saying that, you know, that he became a Muslim because of the work of some Rohingya brothers. It's just, I think, I feel like most of the Rohingyas is just, there's something in them that, that you have some spirituality in it. And then, so my brother Makar is here. I, I didn't meet a lot of people, just very few people. You don't meet like stuff like you, you meet lots of people, Pakistanis, Bengali, this stuff. But Rohingya, just I can count how many people we met. But Alhamdulillah, today is the largest number of Rohingya I have seen. Right here. Yes, I'm glad that you are here. The number of people who we are known that Rohingya is, is nice, it's very good experience. But in practice, as an organization, as the Zakat Foundation has been as a tool that trying to help the poor and needy, including Rohingya, for many years. But more specifically, I would say, in 2012, as the speakers mentioned, and there was all pictures and coming out and, and in, the, in the media and uh, horrible pictures and what should we do? And then we more said was more like, a, I, I don't like to share the, what's happening outside, what I can do. Because we are, I'm writing my book, what I can do. At the same time, I also advise what you can do. Let's write the books together, so that the books I'm writing, because when we die, the God is going to ask you, what have you done? Just give us our book. So, what we have done? At that time, 2012, thanks to uh, Dr. Wakar and then Amnesty International, because the work of working God, that, that just goes two aspects. One is advocacy, previous speaker, so other one is the humanitarian. So, advocacy aspect is that it's needed, which Zakat Foundation cannot do much about it. However, we need a partner to do it. We had to partner together, at that time, we partnered with the Amnesty International, we tell them, look, uh, let's do something in Washington, D.C., we support you, and then we organize a, a rally in uh, Myanmar Embassy, which, alhamdulillah, we have done it. That was nice. Almost 100 people came, and uh, everything counts. At that time, those who attended, their books are written, and just recorded. And after that, we set up some small group of uh, most professionals, uh, in, in Washington D.C. every year we have a dinner for the for the Rohingya cause, and uh, it has been going on. So just last one we did in Ramadan. Every Ramadan we did, Alhamdulillah. And then other organization that we partner with is the, the U.S. Uh, uh, campaign for Burma. That, that, that Simon, a good friend, which is, he lives in D.C. He lived in for 30 years in uh, uh, Burma, and then he's very passionate about it. And uh, about the, he's trying to do that, I think that, and then he is doing the, the house program, he knows him, 
and then I'm glad that I just have more people that are passionate about it and then just as, as things are, you know, look bad, there's a hope. Hope means more optimistic hope. Things are getting, is much better inshallah. Because like three years ago when we were talking about how many Bohungas are there in, uh, in, in the United States, they said maybe 50, 60 they were saying. But now there's a lot more. Now what I see is that I hear young people, and, and then the, with the help of the people, we are going to do more work. One thing that I have noticed, because we work in 40 countries, one thing that it causes, if, if this Rohingya case is like another country's case, and then they will bring more voice. Because less more Rohingyas in the United States, is, it looks like a little bit orphan. We deal with the orphan, this, this, this issue has become like an orphan issue. When I say not a, in the real sense, it's just a, because not many people are really paying attention. And those one. It, but Alhamdulillah, just as you say, you came here, you did a great job, and then come, come here, and then with what you learn here, and then you just go outside and it multiplicate. Allah will give barakah and blessings to do to your coming here, and then inshallah, then things are going to get much better. I'm very optimistic about it. In terms of the humanitarian aspect, what we have in the, it's a challenging. You know, that they tell that they don't want United humanitarian organization to go help in Rohingya people in Burma, especially. And then, uh, but around the world, we are trying our best to do it. And then, uh, we have been doing the, the uh, refugees in, let's say, India, Malaysia, in Thailand, and then the Bangladesh, and then, uh, in, inshallah, in, in Chicago, uh, in, in, in New York, uh, USA as well. It's a challenging. I mean, we have done pretty much all the places, whatever we can do. But those who do work, all we want is that, let us help. Because American Muslims are ready to help. Although not many people here are American Muslims, but, but when we reach out to them, they are very helpful. Because they help the people of the Bosnia, people of Kosovo, they have been, they have been the best time. Syria, they have been helping, very generous people. They are helping, I know that they are helping this uh, cause as well. One thing is that is sometimes it becomes limited because of the access. We try, we struggle, there's a challenge is the helping to the uh, so, but we try our best, first of all, Bangladesh, they tell how the Bangladesh government doesn't want Rohingya, and then Burma doesn't want the Rohingya, they are in the middle in the refugee camps. Now we, go, we have an office in Bangladesh, okay. we have an office in, and the current government doesn't like Rohingya much. The previous government was nicer in terms of humanitarian, that we have been doing the good job in, in, the, in the area. When the current government comes, it tells us, look, if you help Rohingya, I'm going to close you, keep you out but they kick out of the uh, doctors without borders. And then we said, okay, we are not helping, that's fine. Officially, we just keep us, we'll do it. But how we are helping, I'm just going to tell you this, is that, uh, is that we help through the people whom we trust, like uh, the volunteer type of people, with whom we tested. Officially, and for example, Dr. Rafa Kals, he doesn't have official relationship with the Rekat the, the Foundation. Or well, there are some people that they don't have official relationship with it. But we trust them, we help them, the, the Rohingya as much as we can in that place. Even in the, not only the refugee camps, in some time inside the, uh, in, inside the, uh, in the Burma. At the same time, in terms of uh, advocacy point, in the 2012, you know, we advocated the Turkish government, I brought you from Turkey. Turkish government is very helpful for the refugees and helping the old humanitarian castles. And then they, even, the, you know, Prime Minister at that time visited. Uh, although they didn't give full access to the areas, and, but but we, 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 we had to some part inside it. And then still they are trying to do it. We have in contact with them every day. We give the, when the summer, when there was, a, you know, the ship is, is stranded. And then we called them, what's going on? Why are you guys not doing anything? Just that everyone, you know, uh, they said, well, they, were, they are ready to send the ship, but they, they want to help the, the, the government like Indonesia or Malaysia, so they can do those. They, they um, we get the feedback like this. And uh, what other things we did, for example, we send, uh, a journalist, a TV producer, Kevin McCormick, last year to the, the Burma. He has no official relation to the Cap Foundation. We told him, look, as a freelancer, you know what we want you to do is to go document it, what's happening, and then come and tell people here. He went there, he had a limited uh, access, they didn't let him go to the areas. And he's an American person, he's a famous TV personality, in the past he was, he was uh, doing it, and he, he had a hard time to, to enter in the areas, and, but documentary, I mean, didn't become the, just like uh, it became a general other part of the Burma, but not the Arakan state. So these are the things that have been doing it. Now, what's in it for us? Now, we have uh, the, the Jakarta Foundation founded in the, in the, uh, 
in Chicago. This is our home. So you got this home in Chicago, in the bridge view. And we have about 180 families from Rohingya. So we welcome everybody. I think 20 of them are here. And then what we decided, and then with the brothers here, Ujafwa, and then the Maulana is here. And then we are helping to open a uh, Rohingya center in Chicago. We have our full support, inshallah, to do that. The, whatever needs to do. They told me there are 200 students. But education unit, inshallah, then, then the Cut Foundation committed to help you right here in Chicago. And then feel home while you are comfortable, inshallah, with you and us. We help the people who be left over there. We are not going to forget them. First, strengthening ourselves, and then we are going to have everybody over there, inshallah. And uh, that's about it. I just want to mention you. Just uh, I can go over and over and over. But those who want the, the, the help to the cows, those who are from Chicago, and raise your hand again. And those who are not from India, can you uh, raise your hand? Okay. I'm going to match, you know, the just the spot thing. While we are helping, inshallah, we need your support to help this. Together, we are going to do it together. So now, I want you to just, all of you, inshallah, Chicago people, okay, I know Chicago people are very generous people, you know, generous people that, uh, uh, and then they're going to help you. And then I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about it. With that one, inshallah, not only Chicago, also we are in contact with the Rohingya in, in Houston, as well as Atlanta, and uh, inshallah, we're going to help other people. There. But Chicago is going to, inshallah, nice for the Rohingya. And then together we are going to help more people, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Murad Kozi uh, of Zakat Foundation. And especially I want to thank Mr. Kozi for his initiative to work with the Rohingya community in Chicago that I heard yesterday. I was updated by the community here. Uh, initiative, good initiative they took to advance the Rohingya uh, community here in their education and all other th aspects of their lives. So inshallah, uh, I, we hope uh, you will be very, very uh, successful and please thank Brother Murad for that. Um, last, not the least, our ambassador, a special U.S. envoy to OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, uh, Mr. Arsalan Suleiman. Uh, he is a U.S. envoy to OIC. OIC means what? Everybody knows, right? Organization of Islamic Cooperation. There's the same organization. There's a 57 member state organization, OIC, is the backbone of Rohingya cause, Alhamdulillah. OIC is the one who formed our Rohingya Union. Uh, in the Jeddah, in their headquarters of the river to bring all Rohingya community together and make a one single voice on the Rohingya issue. Our Rohingya Union. So we are very pleased to work with OIC, with the State Department together on, on this Rohingya cause. I want to give you a little bio sketch, background of uh, Mr. Arsalan Suleiman. Uh, he works to deepen and expand the partnership between United States government and the OIC member countries that President Obama himself has announced in Cairo, Egypt in June of 2009 uh, for engagement with OIC member countries. That is brother uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Rarsalan Suleiman is instrumental in that initiative that President Obama has, has uh, taken. He is currently working in a lot of areas in that respect, particularly in civil matters, education, health, science and technology, human rights, and many other areas that the United States government has engaged with 57 member country organization, which is in, 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 for the matter, for that matter, the second largest organization in the world after the United Nations, 57 member states. At that, uh, that Brother Suleiman is uh, very engaged in that effort by the United States in working with OIC member countries. And Brother Suleiman will give you a little his overview of what they have done on Rohingya issues from Washington, D.C., from the State Department. Please welcome Mr. Suleiman. Assalamu alaikum. 
Thank you, uh, Brother Wakar Udin. Thank you to our guests, uh, our Rohingya guests who are here and who are able to testify in person about the situation that's happening uh, in Burma, Myanmar. Um, and our guests as well who was able to witness it there and, and all of our distinguished panelist members who have uh, been able to travel there, many of them themselves, and, and see this firsthand and are doing really um, important grassroots mobilization effort to ensure that there is uh, the relevant and necessary pressure from you all, from the communities, and from the governments to try to change the situation that's happening in Burma. Because as we all know and as we all, we've all heard, the situation is unacceptable. And it's, it's a situation that has to change. Uh, and the United States government is recognizing that. And we're using all available bilateral and multilateral channels to exert that pressure. And so I'll just give you a, a brief overview because I know that we are short on time about some of those efforts and some of the efforts that we're working on with the OIC as well. Because, um, you know, in, in the world of diplomacy, um, there are oftentimes many situations in countries where there are human rights abuses, there are situations like the Rohingya are facing where their rights are not respected, where they're facing violence and discrimination and ethnic cleansing. Um, and the tools available to government sometimes uh, don't necessarily lend themselves to an immediate solution or situation. But we, our jobs, are to continue that pressure, to continue to use all available tools and to ensure that all of the voices are collectively heard uh, to put that pressure on. And so that's what we've been trying to do uh, from our office, the ORC Special Envoys Office. But bilaterally from the United States, as many of our previous speakers have mentioned, Burma is undergoing a transition. For 60 years, they had a military dictatorship as their government, and starting in 2010, they began to change uh, to in, in enact some democratic reforms and democratic transition. And um, it's the United States policy to support that democratic transition. We want to see a Burma that is unified, that respects the human rights of all of its citizens, and that is a democracy, because we feel that democratic governments in the long term are the governments that are best suited to ensure that all of their people uh, are respected, all their rights are respected. And some of our panelists mentioned Sri Lanka and the links between different uh, extremist groups who may be operating in Sri Lanka or Burma uh, and other countries. And Sri Lanka itself has gone through a bit of a democratic renaissance uh, where earlier this year in January they had a historic presidential election where the uh, reigning president who had turned his country, uh, which was emerging from a civil war, a successful civil war against a uh, terrorist group, the Liberation Tigers of Dhamma Ilan. But after that victory, the country went in a very authoritarian direction. And the people of that country in January of this year decided that they don't want to see that authoritarianism because part of that authoritarian move was the rise of extremist groups, was the rise of violence against Muslims in Sri Lanka, against Christians in Sri Lanka. And in January, they, they voted to reject that government and they elected a new government, a government that promised to have a, a, a platform of inclusiveness, of human rights, of democracy. And they reaffirmed that commitment to it just last month when they elected a parliament in the parliamentary elections, when they endorsed the platform of that reformist government. And we want to see the same outcome in Burma. Our panelists mentioned that there's an election coming up in November in Burma. We want to see an election that ensures that the political leaders in Burma are going to be working towards an inclusive country, a country where the rights of all individuals, including the Rohingya, are respected. And because in the long term, that's, that's the best way to ensure that. And um, our government, our leaders, President Obama, has made it very clear. He's stated on his visits uh, in 2012 and in 2015, He's mentioned the Rohingya specifically during the White House iftar. He also mentioned the Rohingya specifically and, and recognized a Rohingya, a, 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 a Burmese political prisoner who was there, Wei Wei Nu. And so at the top levels of our government, we are pushing the, the Burmese government to ensure that they are respecting the rights and that, that they are living up to their commitment to improve the living conditions and secure the full human rights and fundamental freedoms for all communities in Rakhine State, including the Rohingya. And in our bilateral engagement with the Burmese government, we've made this clear and we've made it a priority, and also multilaterally. We've been working with countries in the region, with the ASEAN governments, and as Mr. Andrews noted, it's a very interesting diplomatic situation because ASEAN and many other countries, including many of the OIC countries, as a general matter, 
They try not to criticize each other's internal affairs because they don't want their own internal affairs criticized. And so it's a diff difficult diplomatic um, challenge to get countries like Indonesia, like Malaysia, like Bangladesh, like the OIC members, the Gulf countries, to actually raise with the government of Burma the situation of the Rohingya and to make that a point of priority. And uh, you know, we've been very pleased that the OIC has made this a priority. Um, the OIC Secretary General has appointed a special envoy, a uh, former foreign minister from Malaysia, Mr. Aldar, to, to personally engage in diplomacy on this issue, and he's been very successful in, in ensuring that the Indonesian and Malaysian governments uh, during the, the migrant crisis did end up taking a lot of the Rohingya refugees who were fleeing the country into their country, and a number of OIC member states also, at the behest of the organization, did end up giving assistance to Indonesia and Malaysia to defray some of the costs, and, and we out of the State Department were encouraging and supporting those efforts for the OIC. And we also co-sponsored the resolution that Dr. Bakarli mentioned in the Human Rights Council that focused specifically on the situation of uh, the Rohingya and other minorities in Burma who are facing this situation. Uh, and so we continue that effort and we look forward to your support in those efforts because as our previous speakers have mentioned, your voice is critical. Your voices to Congress, to have them step up the pressure is important. Your voices to the administration, to say that individuals who are involved in human rights violations should be put on the sanctions list is important. And we, we want to see that. We want to see that engagement continue, and we want to see uh, that pressure continue, not just from the governments and our diplomatic activity, but also from our grassroots members from the American Muslim community. And also, just before I close, I just want to mention that from the humanitarian perspective, this is also an area that the United States has been very active. Um, over the past year, we've settled over 1,000 Rohingya in this country, the refugees who are fleeing. Um, and that's going to be something that um, we are open to on an ongoing basis. Hopefully the root cause of the situation, the treatment of, of the Rohingya in the country is resolved and improved. So that can help stem the flow of refugees, but we are, we are contributing to the resettlement of refugees in this country. And also since fiscal year, 24, uh, fiscal year 2014, we've given over $109 million of humanitarian assistance in order to ensure that the Rohingyas who are living in in, in camps uh, who have who've been displaced internally and who have also been displaced and are in other countries are receiving the aid that is necessary for them for them to uh, to survive. Uh, so thank you again for your interest. Thank you again for all of your um, efforts and your advocacy. And uh, we look forward to that continuing and, and continuing to work with you all. And I would like to thank again Dr. Bogardi and for all of his efforts and the efforts of all of our other panelists um, for uh, all the work that they're doing. Thank you. Thank you.